Here's how to use Descartes' rule of signs and how to make those big scary tables you've probably seen. So here's the example that we'll be doing in this video. We need to use Descartes' rule of signs on this big long thing. So what is Descartes' rule of signs? Well, it's basically just a way of predicting the kinds of answers that we would get if we solved for x. And if you're wondering how we would even solve for x, because it's not even an equation, we're talking about if it equaled zero. This is why your homework probably talks about finding the types of zeros. Zeros are just a fancy way of saying the answer. So they're called zeros because it's where it equals zero. So we could like graph this and find all the zeros, but that would take forever. So instead, we can use Descartes' rule of signs to determine the possible list of positive answers, negative answers, and imaginary answers that we could have. So like I just said, there's three types of answers we can get. So there's positive real answers, there's negative real answers, and then there's imaginary answers. Now the important thing to note here is that the amount of answers we're going to have is always the biggest exponent. So what's the biggest exponent here? Well, it looks like it's right here, right? Six is our biggest exponent, which means that in total, we have to have six answers, or in this case, we're gonna call them zeros. So when we're talking about our different combinations of zeros, they have to equal six. So we could have four positive real ones, two negative real ones, and no imaginary, or they could all be imaginary, who knows? So how do we figure out how many of each we have? Well, we're not going to figure out exactly, but we can figure out a list of the different possibilities. So to find out how many positive answers we have, po or positive real answers, we need to figure out how many times the sign changes. So first of all, remember that this first term here is positive because there's no negative sign on it, so that means it's positive. So we're going to see how many times it changes. Does it change here? Nope, no change, right? What about here? Yes, it changes from positive to negative. So we have our first change. What about here? Nope, it doesn't change, right? Here, it does change. It goes from negative to positive. So that's another change. What about to here? Yes, it changes here as well. And then finally, what about here? Yep, it changes here as well. So here's the important part of Descartes' rule of signs. Descartes' rule of signs says that for every time the sign changes, that's how many positive real answers you can have or you can decrease that by an even number. I know that doesn't make much sense, but here, I'll explain it. So we had four sign changes, which means it's possible that we have four positive real zeros, or in this case, that just means positive answers, like three or seven, but we might not have four of them. We can decrease this number by two and still have a possible amount of zeros. So we could have four, we could also have two, or we could also subtract this by two again and have zero. So we could have four positive answers, we could have two positive answers, or we could have zero positive answers. You always keep subtracting the number by two for your different possibilities. So for example, we're not gonna have three positive real zeros. That, that's not possible because you would have to subtract four by one. You have to keep subtracting by two. So like for example, if the sign changed five times, then you could have five positive real zeros. You could also have, if you subtract this by two, three positive real zeros, and you could also have one positive real zero, but you cannot have like two or four. Now that's just for positive real zeros. How about for negative real zeros? That's just a fancy way of saying negative answers. So like negative two or negative 400. So to figure out negative real zeros, we need to figure out how many times the sign changes just like before but with negative x in place of x. So I'm going to show you the technical way to do this and then kind of a shortcut that you can use that's basically the same thing. So we need to replace x with negative x. So instead of x to the sixth, we're going to have negative x to the sixth. Instead of plus 4x to the fifth, we're going to have plus 4 times negative x to the fifth. And we're just going to repeat this all the way down. So how on earth do we know what negative x to the sixth is? Well, let's go ahead and write it out, right? we're gonna have negative x six times. So it's gonna be negative x times 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 negative x. So remember that two negatives make a positive. So we're gonna have negative x times negative x. Well, x times x is x squared and two negatives make a positive. So that means this is x squared and this is x squared. And now we just have all positive numbers. So two x's times another two x's times another two x's, that's gonna be a total of six. So it just didn't change from before. So this is x to the sixth, just like it was before. But what if we had x to the fifth? 
Well, in that case, we're taking away one of the minus x's, right? We're only going to have five of them now. And remember, minus x times minus x, that's x squared, positive x squared, because too many negatives make a positive. And same over here. But this minus x is going to stay. So we end up having five x's, so that's x to the fifth, but one minus sign, so the minus sign stays. So in this case, we're actually going to have negative x to the fifth. And this would be the same thing as if we just moved this sign out to the front, because remember, these are being multiplied together. And one negative stays when you multiply. So this is going to be negative 4 times x to the fifth. And you'll notice that this looks exactly the same as this, except we switch the sign. So here's the shortcut that I was talking about. Whenever you have an even exponent like this, the negative signs are all going to cancel out, and it's just going to stay exactly the same. But if you have an odd-numbered exponent, then it's all going to stay the same, except you're going to be left with a negative sign. So what that means is whenever you have an even exponent like this one, negative 2x to the fourth, it just stays the same. So that's going to be negative 2x to the fourth. And whenever you have an odd exponent, you know it's going to leave a negative sign. So you're going to have to change the sign. So negative 3x to the third becomes positive 3x to the third. So technically, you don't even actually need to do any of this stuff here. I, I just showed you that because it's helpful to know what it is you're doing. But this is a shortcut that will basically do the exact same thing. So plus 7x squared, 2 is an even number, so it's going to stay the same. Minus x, remember this is technically x to the 1. And 1 is an odd number, so this is going to change the sign to positive x. And then plus 1, there's no x here, so that means it's to the 0, and 0 is an even number, so plus 1 stays the same. So now that we have our new polynomial here, now that x has been changed to negative x, we can now figure out how many times the sign changes and get our negative real zeros. So does it change here? Well, yes, it does, actually, because this is a positive number here in the front, and it turns into a negative number. So yes, it does change. What about here? Nope, it was negative here, and it's still negative, right? What about here? Yes, it does, right? It was negative, and now it's positive. So that is a yes. What about here? Nope. It's a plus, and it's still a plus. So, nope. What about here? Nope, it's still a plus, right? And then what about here? It's still a plus. So, no. So, we have two sign changes, which means we can have two negative real zeros, or, remember, you can subtract the number by 2 and get another possibility. So, 2 minus 2 is 0, so we could also have 0 negative real zeros. And these are our only two possibilities. We can only have either 2 or 0. We're not going to have 4. You can't add 2 to it to get other possibilities because we only change the sign twice. So now our last possibility that I was talking about is imaginary zeros. But there's actually no like rule of changing signs to figure it out. Imaginary zeros are just going to be whatever zeros are left over when we're done with our positive and negative ones. Because remember that we know we have to have six zeros or six answers. So for example, if we found out that there are two positive real zeros and no negative real zeros, well that only adds up to two. We know we have to have six of them, so the other four must be imaginary. So here's what we're going to do. Using this information that we just found out about here, we're going to make a table. It's going to be a list of all the different possibilities of answers that we can have. So we're going to have positive answers. We're going to have negative answers. We're going to have imaginary answers, which I'll put I for imaginary. And then we're going to have our total amounts. Now remember, for every possibility, we're always going to have a total of six answers every time. That's not going to change. Now we can have either four, two, or zero positive zeros. So we're going to write 4, 2, and 0 on our table. But you might be wondering why I'm spacing these out, and that's because we also need to write our negative real zeros, because we can have two of them or we can have zero of them. So for every single one of our possibilities for positive, we need to write our possibilities for negative. So we can have 4 and 2. We could also have 4 and 0. We can have 2 and 2. We could also have 2 and 0. We could have 0 and 2. We can also have 0 and 0. If you're not sure if you have the right amount of rows, a good way to check is to see that there are three possibilities here and two possibilities here. And if you multiply them together, 3 times 2 is 6. 
So we have six rows here. We need to have six rows for our table. So these are all the different possibilities for our positive and negative answers. And remember that they're always going to total to six. So every row is going to have six. So our last step here is to figure out how many imaginary zeros we're going to have in each case. So here we have four positive and two negative. Four plus two is six. So that's all of our six answers. So if we had any imaginary answers, that would put us over six, which is we're, we only have six. We know that which means in this case, we have no imaginary answers. What about here? This row here, we have four positive and zero negative. That only totals up to four. We need six in total, which means two of them must be imaginary so that we can have a total of six. Now, what about here? We have two positive and two negative. Two plus two is four. So we only have four answers. We need to have a total of six. So two of them must be imaginary. Now here we have two positive and zero negative. That's only two answers. We need to have six. So how many must be imaginary? Four. We need to have four imaginary ones to make up for the lack of answers. And it's the same thing here. Here we have no positive and two negative. We need to have four imaginary answers to have a total of six. And finally, our last possibility is that we literally have no positive or negative answers. We just have no real answers, which means all six of them would have to be imaginary. So uh, what's our answer? This whole thing is. This whole table is our answer. This is our table of possibilities. If you wanted to find out which one it actually is, well, you would have to graph this and figure out all the zeros yourself. But Descartes' rule of signs is basically just a way of figuring out the different possibilities. So what this tells you is that, for example, you would never have three positive, one negative, and two imaginary. You would not get these answers from this equation because it's not in the list of possibilities according to Descartes' rule of signs. So this table is our final answer. So I hope this cleared up a lot of how to use Descartes' rule of signs. And I know it can be a little bit tricky to understand at first or even understand the purpose of what you're doing, but just take it slow, take it one step at a time, and you'll understand. But this isn't the only rule that you learn about the zeros of a polynomial. There's also something called the complex conjugates theorem which is just really fun to say. If you want to learn about the complex conjugates theorem, then you can watch this video right here. And as always, if you have any questions about Descartes' rule of signs, then you can go ahead and leave a comment and I'll be sure to answer your question. Thanks for watching.